problem here, and we see a real push by successive governments, and this one again, to put business people on advisory boards, to put business people into the actual tertiary institutions to try and give them a business focus. They've just put in um, a Macquarie banker to run the CSIRO. Is that the kind of thing you think they need? Is that is that a help? I'm just wondering what lessons you might have seen from the UK experience, or, I, I or things a, not to follow. You know, I think it's a good idea. I think you need that those business disciplines. I mean, one thing that business does teach you is about allocation of resources because you've got, always got limited resources, limited amount of money, limited amount of people, everything else, and you have to use it to get to that goal. And a lot of the times, you know, people in, in the academic world are not trained so much to worry about that, and they're not particularly good at it. I and mean, we're all good and bad at different things. But, but also, just to bring in some sort of other sort of disciplines, I mean, I used to have a problem because professors, in that, in that world, it used to be publish, publish or perish. And as you know, if you publish information, you invalidate a patent if you haven't applied for the patent yet. So if you've got this invention, don't go and publish it because you'll never be able to patent it. But the professors were trying to get it out there and we'd have to say, slow down, slow down, let's patent everything first. So, you know, there's a lot of things that they need to learn. Uh, but also there's a lot that they can teach the business people. But bringing the two skills together is, is, is absolutely necessary. Well, last time we talked, we talked about how hard it was for small companies, new companies, startups, new tech to get investment post-GFC, as we call it in this country. Um, it's the same problem here, even though our banks are very strong. Um, small business will tell you they're not lending. I'm assuming in the last three months it hasn't got any better over there. I think it's, it's very tough. I mean, you know, we really had a, a, just about a Great Depression for, for small companies and if you didn't have money and one of the disciplines I've always adhered to was, was for companies was raising money when they can when they had good news raise some money when the market's strong raise some money fund yourself whenever the conditions are good because when things are bad small companies particularly sort of half research type companies which are still running at a loss there's no money there's no equity and there's no debt and no chance it's I was very say, it's a message the big business has done they seem to be raising money while they can now yeah, as well it's absolutely. not just small i yeah. mean if you look at the capital raisings you could say well if the big guys mm. are doing it but just on that then where is this this block what's going to open it i mean there's talk that governments have to push banks to lend more to the sector but but is it just going to be tough for a long time you mean or small businesses small in particular businesses, yeah. well you know they really are the tail on the dog you know and and, and when when you know, if you get a, a, you know, a year, 18 months, two years of a boom, everyone will rush into that small stuff because it races up in value quickly. But when it's, when it's a re half recessed, then no one wants to know. So it goes from boom to bust to boom to bust, big cycles. So nothing's going to turn that around in a hurry. And, and you can't, re you know, until we get solid economic growth, right, and particularly in, in Europe, which is might we be a while, which might be a while away. We're having a boom in you know, maybe, country. Maybe we have to get some, some Aussie <laughs> banks to go and lend some money in Europe, you know, in Ireland, uh, you know. Well, it made me think, actually, talking about the difference, but, you know, things are better here. Um, in the old days, it used to be, especially in the financial markets, that really, to make it, you have to have worked in New York or London, you know, to go offshore. You went offshore. Do you think it's still the case now? I mean, you must see a lot of expats heading over. I don't think there's many jobs in London in the city at the moment, is there? No. I mean, you know, I've been talking about this with friends, but there's so many people coming back. You know, well, you know, what the, the the pound Aussie rate. You know, you used to be able to get two and a half dollars to your to your pound. Now you get a dollar sixty or something. You know, it's moved a massive amount. What is it? Forty percent. It's so w the money you're earning living in London, which you used to ship back here and save up and come back here, is is forty percent less. So the relative salaries are now probably lower in the UK. The unemployment rate is what seven, nearly eighty percent in the UK. It's only about five percent here, so it's harder to get a job there, right? So the job opportunities are less there than they are here. The money is probably less there than they are here. So people are starting to come back, and the economy is strong. I mean, there's opportunities here. It's easy to start companies. It's easy to do things here. So yeah. I think you'll see the Move the reverse. The other way. Yeah, well, the reverse. Yeah, things are looking but you'll good. never convince the pommies that there aren't zillions of Aussies living in their country. And I think there's actually more Pommies living here, aren't there? I say, listen, there's more Poms down in our country than up here. I think there's here. a million of us over there or something. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's big numbers. Now, listen, last time I spoke to you, you had a couple of other things on the go, because you're a bit of a media personality in the UK, I should say. You had um, a city top model, a you know America's top, top model yeah. meets the apprentice, I guess. That's still being worked out. You're still working on that. So I'm no sort news of dating that. the fourth one now. I've been doing the fifth. No, I no, mean, no, I no. meant the program. The program hasn't come out yet. No, not yet. You talked about a small business venture you were looking at with Rolf Harris on coat hangers. I gather there's nothing much to report on that there, yet. We're getting Like I was talking about before, you know, and I've been trying to sort of, you know, talk to Rolf about it. It's a long commercialisation. It's a long, hard slog to get a new type of coat hanger into the market. But if you're out there and you're looking for a new sort of coat hanger, we're onto it. You know, so, right. but it does take time. Well, we'll be first to hear on the Rolf Harris coat hanger. And I 
I think so my your microphone's there. Just pick it up. I'll, we'll talk amongst ourselves. Now, um, Foxtel viewers might be seeing you. I think uh, Dragon's Den, you were also one of the original judges on Dragon's Den, a show where we were talking earlier about investing in small businesses. If anyone hasn't seen it, it was a program where um, entrepreneurs came in with a business idea and a group of panellists who had funds would come and advise them. I think it's pretty well a uh, well-known show now and they're running episodes at the moment with you on it. I mean, is that a sign of just, it's always been hard? I mean, just tell us a little about Dragon's Den, your experience on that, because that's what gave you a big profile. Yeah, I think they tried Dragon's Den here, but I don't think it was very successful. No, but they, they mixed it up. I mean, you know, we did have serious investors like myself on, on that show, but I think here they sort of, you know, made it a bit more entertainment. But uh, over there it's had a huge impact in, in some countries like Japan, but in the UK it's had a huge impact. Be uh, and, and it really has brought sort of terms into the sort of household, like first mover advantage, the value of patents, you know, you know, barriers to entry, you know, co you know, margin, you know, cost margins, all that sort of thing, net profits, of all those sort of things. And the demographics of that show, are, which is why I went on it, the demographics of that show is unbelievable. You get as many women, as young people, men, and it really has brought small business into the household, which is good. Uh, and but we, you know, we do get some crazy inventions. You know, like we. The uh, Probably the craziest was a guy that came on, uh, you know, and, and he, he came on and he lived in the UK and he'd often go to France. And, and so obviously you have to drive on the other side of the road when you go, you know, and you get confused, which is fair enough, right? But his invention was a one-handed glove. Right. So as you, when you go into France, being an English person, and I'm quite, not quite sure how it worked, but the invention was you put the, the glove on one hand and that would remind you to drive on the right hand side when you're driving in France. Now why you don't just get a little piece of sticky, sticker and put an arrow on it or something like that, but anyway he would have this one handed glove and then that would help him and that was his invention. But what came out of the analysis, you know, because we all kind of asked him questions and stuff, and what came out was, was that he was actually paying more to get one glove made than to get two gloves. There you and go. I and thought that's the anti-business plan. But needless to but, say, you didn't invest in it. But the advice to him, and this is good advice, the advice to him was to start one business in the UK selling the left-handed glove, and one business in the in France selling the right-handed glove. <laughs> that was your idea. <laughs> I think it was. Yeah, I'll take credit for it anyway. Brilliant. Look, we have to leave it there. You're full of helpful advice for people, aren't you? Good luck in the outback. Thank you, Don't Jenny. get lost. Thank you. Hope the treasure map, because you obviously need yep. some extra money, yes. I would say. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was Richard Farley. Uh, we have